have more, we'll ball them up a little better. This didn't fly too well. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce it next to uh, Andy to do the intro to Dr. Ball. I'm Annie Bird, Director of InvestCovets in Atlanta, and I'm helping companies finding business opportunities uh, in Quebec and ultimately benefiting from a 37.5% tax credit on the salaries of agent developers. I am so pleased to be here with you today and have the chance to introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Buschewski. He's a serious serial entrepreneur, originally from Alberta, Canada, and he is known for pushing the boundaries of artificial intelligence and computer graphics. After obtaining his PhD from McGill University, he developed the first cloud-based human simulator at my virtual model. He also developed both PS2 and Xbox game engines at the Aether Interactive. His first company was founded in 2000 and called AI Impact, and it was a crowd simulation program with people doing simple tasks. It was acquired by Prezagis in 2005. Two years later, he started a new venture called Rip Entertainment, creating complex characters for a range of gaming companies like EA, Disney, and BioWare. It was acquired in 2011 by Autodesk. Today, Dr. Prusovsky's new venture built on his previous experience working with computer vision technology. In April of 2014, he founded Branch in a Montreal incubator, Tandem Launch, where he has developed deep learning AI, AI body tracking software. Let's hear how their technology enables computers to read human body language to make the world safer and maybe, surely, a little bit more fun. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Krzyzewski. All right, great. Um, Oh, I got a clicker and everything. All right. Yes. So we've got the. Uh, well, good. You know, it's before lunch, so let's. It's a game development conference, so let's have fun. Uh, all right. So the alternative title that uh, I, is from Pigs to Pixels. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I uh, got uh, in this business, and hopefully it inspires some young younger people to try it out. All right, so yes, as Andy said, I'm from Canada, the Great White North, let's see. So, okay, so that's Canada, you're down here. Okay, so that's where we are. Uh, so, I'm from Alberta, but I live in Quebec. And the interesting thing is that, I, what do you call the local little store where you buy beer? What's it called? I have no idea in North Carolina. Corner store, okay, see, there you go. Where I come from, we call it a convenience store. And where I live, it's called a date dinner. So, fun fact. All right, you're gonna learn a lot of fun facts. So, there, uh, I grew up on a farm in Alberta, so that's, that's the old house I grew up in. That's not what it was looked like when I was born. So that's my dad now, but uh, that's my B1O house. My poor mother, and there was no running water. So this also gives a sense of just how, I think, things have changed just even 50 years, right? Electricity, no running water, that's the homestead. Uh, much bigger, better. So I want to talk about 1981. This is about computer graphics, not about uh, electrification of rural Alberta. That's me. Uh, you can see I have the same uh, uh, style as before. And that's what I wanted. I don't know if any of you know what that is. That's a TRS-80 color computer. That was the thing in 1981. That's 16K. You buy it, you plug it in to a TV, right? And then it works. And then if you want to store program, you plug it into a cassette recorder. So I'm talking like completely alien language to like 90% of the audience. Right? So, uh, and then and it, was, it was, this this was, oh my god, I get excited. I want it so bad. One problem, I needed a thousand dollars Canadian. That's a thousand dollars Canadian then, so that would be way too much. So how do I get a thousand bucks, right? This is a theme in my life. I want to do something cool. I, I want to. I want to program, but I have the money. So uh, what I did. So uh, we ours was a beef farm, but to raise money for uh, we didn't get allowance or anything. So we raised pigs myself. So that's my pigs. So I sold them. I got two hundred fifty dollars. Um, that's the cycle of life. So 
So I got 250000 or $250. Sorry, my numbers are gotten bigger as I go. And um, I need 1000 bucks. How am I going to leverage this 250 Well, you know, it's Fred's family and fools, right? So go to my brother. That's my younger brother, Todd, there. And the, the, he's smaller there. He's not smaller anymore. He's much bigger than me. And I said, Todd, we love video games. We need to buy a computer. We'll buy a computer to play all the games you want. He's like, bro, I'm in. Awesome, 250, I'm at 500. But I still need 500 bucks, what do I do? All right, well, I go to my dad, and I say, Dad, computers are the future. I want to program, I want to be a programmer, because I'm going to get a great job. And, and I said, I put in 250, Todd's put in 250, matches. He said, sure. And there you go. I get $1,000, I get my computer, and I start typing in, I'm typing in my first program and watching it go, and it's, it's been literally, this is what I've been doing for the last 40 years, is just hacking and hustling. So, um, fast forward, I'm very happy, you know, in my 20s, um, I get a scholarship to uh, go anywhere I want to do my PhD, I won an award, but the, I really want to work on AI, but you know, this is like in 1990. So if you have, how many people have heard of the AI winter? Okay. So it was, it was brutal. I, I was a prologue programmer, a lot of this stuff. It just was dying out there. And so what's to do? Well, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know where I wanted to live in because um, I had gone to Montreal um, and Quebec uh, and during undergrad. And I went there to learn French, and I went there to have fun. I said, wow, this is a, I don't know what I want to study, because like, AI is pretty much dead. And, but man, it's much of a cool place. So I said, OK, I'll go to Neil. Um, why not? And so as I was studying, I was, I, my buddy Clark showed me this paper. And I don't know if you ever, you can't really see it, unfortunately, from the screen. But there's a guy called Craig Reynolds. And he wrote this paper called Boyd's. And what, what would Boyd's was, was a computer system to simulate life. So back before people talked about artificial intelligence, people would talk about artificial life. It's not going to really look great on the screen, I apologize. But so, so this is a game, 1991, and you're seeing this in the graphics, and you're seeing a whole bunch of fish and birds swim in a flock. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I love this. I want to do this kind of stuff. And then my prof, uh, he showed me this book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Plants. So The Algorithmic Beauty of Plants was about how you generate uh, complexity. So you might be familiar with fractals and things to generate computer graphics. Again, I'm showing my age on this. But tell systems were this language that allowed you to express natural growth in a beautiful mathematical pattern. And it was really pioneered by um, a guy called Shemek Prusinkevich. So Shemek Prusinkevich, Polish guy, but worked at the University of Calgary. And uh, I was privileged enough to work with him a little bit. And so that sort of was my inspiration. I, I guess I knew I loved making, uh, I loved, I loved programming, but I think, and probably a lot of us as game developers, programming is one thing, but you know, you can build in a financial system, and, and that's beautiful. And that's important. But there's something joyful about watching the pixel on the screen, the magic that you create this. And the artists, I think, you feel the same way. You create this and it's on the screen, and, you can, and then as a gamer, you can interact with it. That's just so powerful. I, I just wanted to dedicate my life to it. So I, as my bio said, I, I worked. I, I helped build a first a virtual human system in 1998. I was, I, 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 Recruited into to be the first CTO at Behavior Interactive uh, in Montreal. It's still a large game company to this day. And, uh, it's, I think it's the largest independent uh, game developer in Quebec at 500 plus people. And um, built the PS2 engine. But I, as much as I was enjoying all that, my entrepreneurial spirit was there. I was like, OK, I want to build a company. I want to build an AI mobile company. So I started the company AI Plan in 2000. And um, as, as I said, it was crowd simulation. So what's AI in 2000, right? I mean, because there's no deep learning. Expert systems were dead. So 
AI in 2000 is really about crowds, large agent simulation. So what I mean by that is, you know, lots of people not doing. Uh, so we could we could simulate you guys, for example, in the sense of an, you know an interactive audience in the sense of if I if I if I say something funny, some people randomly laugh. If I, when it's end, hopefully you know people clap, but but not really complex. But lots of people. So really, from a business way, we worked on special effects for movies where. You know, you have a thousand people, and this is really so 2000s, right? A thousand people on one hill, a thousand people on the other hill. Running, 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 running. Come together, bang, 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 and they beat each other to death. So um, we, we worked on films. We built this crowd simulator. Uh, you can see some really cool stuff there. Um, then we got sucked into games, uh, because again, I love the interactive. And I've always had this belief that, you know, humans are humans, right? Us here, Montreal, Across the world, we're all humans, and so there shouldn't be a difference in an engine that can simulate humans doing you know, large-scale battles to you know humans evacuating cities. Why and, and why can't we? I've always felt that computer graphics in film, and computer graphics in games are very similar. It's just a question of runtime. So if we could make a runtime engine that happened, then we could put it into games. So we worked on games. There's me in a completely different uh, style uh, back then. And, um, but ultimately, where we got the most interest was in the military, is for military simulation and training. So this is around 2004, and where, you know, everyone would think, wow, the military, they have the best computer graphics, they have the best everything. They actually don't. And this is one of the messages I want to give to you guys, is that the computer game business is huge, and it's probably the single biggest driver of computer graphics in the world. So. We would start, you know, people from like the Marine Corps would call us and say, we want to, you know, use your, you know, your, your, your tech to build training systems and stuff. And we just started licensing it out. And then we started working uh, with a group in Old Dominion University uh, on, on research. And it just got bigger and bigger and bigger uh, until we were acquired by a, um, a large military simulation company in uh, Montreal called, what's called Ingenuity. Then it was bought by CAE, which is the largest simulation company in the world, also based in Montreal. Then it was renamed to Prestigious. Um, so after that, um, I wasn't done. I'm not a, a big company guy. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And I really wanted to keep doing AI, and I still wanted to work in games. But this time, I wanted to work on something a lot. Like, rather than thousands of people doing simple things, how do we do 10 people doing something really, really complex? So you know, think of a complex shooter where you've got you know, you know, squad behaviors. They're they're running at 60 frames a second, highly kinetic environments. How do we build an engine that can simulate this? But again, not just to simulate it because you can hand code all that stuff. But but how can we give tools for artists to, to create these these grades? I should have backed up. So when we built AI Plant, one of the key things was not only could we could simulate thousands of agents, but we actually gave tools for non-programmers to simulate thousands of agents. We let artists simulate agents. And similarly, with Grip, we wanted to give tools, we call it the Microsoft Word of Game AI. Like, let a game designer uh, program this stuff herself. There's no need for a programmer uh, to be in the loop. Uh, worked, worked on a lot of great games, uh, and, 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 but you'll notice, and, and that was our model. And I also want to throw that out as an idea for other entrepreneurs. Is at AI Implant, we built a tool, we built a system, and sold them. But we also worked on a lot of projects. We work on those projects. They would push our tech forward, but we always refactored and brought the code back into the core. And the same thing. We did the exact same thing at Grip. We worked on a lot of great projects, and. Um, and, and, and we built it, we knew that we, we knew that we had a great use case, but we always brought it back, had the discipline to, to move it back into the core engine so that other people could benefit from it, right? And uh, so we got a really great break. Uh, one day, a buddy of mine at IDOS, he calls me, he says, Dr. Paul, I need you. I'm like, awesome. I'm like, you know, we were a little broke at the time, so any business was good. But he said, we're working on Deus Ex. So this was, I don't know, 2010, 2009 when the Deus Ex franchise was getting rebooted. So a huge franchise.
guys, huge expectations. And so we, uh, and then I said, what do you want us to do? We want you to do the boss battles. I'm like, awesome, this is great, you know, because we could use our tech and it was really going to challenge things. So I, I admit, I'm not familiar with the Deus Ex franchise. I do not understand what a rabid fan base the Deus Ex franchise is. So we work on it, we build our tech, we, we, we didn't come up with the game design, then we did the game design that was asked, but we're pushing our tech, we're playing it, we're loving it. We give it back to IDOS, and they give us money, and that's good. And then, then they're going into beta and stuff. We don't hear anything, and then, you know, we're like, and everything's cool, and we're, ah, oh, I can't wait for the game to come out, can't wait. And then, then just before the game came out, the guys at IOS Montreal, fantastic bunch, they said, hey, we're doing a making of, so we'd love you to be in this making of. I said, yeah, 100%, we'll be in this making of. So they start filming, they, so I go in there, super high production values, they're filming us, and they're like, blah, 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 and I'm answering questions, and I'm like, wow, this is so great, man. And, and I'm like, I can't wait for everyone to find out about this. So bang, the game comes out. And we get, and, and, and we start seeing reviews. And they're like, this is the greatest game ever. But the boss battles are garbage. Who did the boss battles? I hate them. It was like, and I'm like, ooh, this is bad. And we, we buy it, you know, we get a copy, and we start playing it, and we're like, wait, this is different from what we built. And I'm like, and I'm like talking to Aaron, my partner, Aaron, yeah, he's like, dude, this is totally the wrong thing. Because we, we, we had a nice old copy, right? So we go go per first, we rebuild our version. Like, no, that's what we built. And we play the Deus Ex version. Wait, that's totally different. Like, ooh. Like, we'll back. But, again, what can we do, right? We're, you know, we're contractors, and we're like, then, the perfect storm. They launch the video. They launch the video of the making of. And then Paul shows up on YouTube. Millions of people start watching this, and they're like, he's the guy. He's the guy who destroyed the boss maps. And it was a fascinating experience, because I was getting like hate mail, like visceral hate mail. Like, I, I wait for so one thing, no, if you are a rabid game developer, step back, step back, chill, and maybe don't write those emails, because they're, they're harsh. And you maybe not know the whole story. So, long story short, we had to wait about six months of, of getting like basically hate mail on a daily basis. And then I lost bless them. But we had to wait. And then the other thing, they, and then they, they announced publicly, hey, we have a patch. Uh, we want to let you know that we completely changed, uh, gripped it exactly what you asked, and um, and then we changed it. And you know we were very happy with grip. And here's here's the version that we gripped it. And, and then phew, the hate mail stopped. But so long story short, if you Google me, I'm the guy who destroyed the boss titles. So that was that was my like peak of game notoriety, and I'm like, I'm like wow, okay. Uh, uh, Autodesk bought us, and I, I think I was pretty much done on the game space by that point. Uh, so um, I took a little seizure in um, after after Autodesk, and I got to go to Cambridge, England to uh, a buddy of mine, um, started a biotech company. And uh, it's all computers everywhere now. And it's bioinformatics. And, and they invited me to, uh, they said, we need help with the computers. We, we have way too much data. We don't understand how to manage all this data. And I, I'm sort of, frankly, a little burnt out. And I wanted to, I said, you know what? Let's, let's try this. Let's, let's go work in bioinformatics for, for a year. So I did that. and. Great experience, uh, and, and why I'm telling this is I want you to always think, I think so many disciplines are so similar, the more, the more you know about other disciplines, the more you can actually do your own job better. That's, that's where I'm going with this. And so in games, talking to film people, talking to military people, you really want to talk to different people, because it's going to give you a, a different perspective on things. And what I got out of the biotech people is when you actually drill into molecular biology, it's really similar to programming. Um, they just happen to use, you know, proteins and things. Uh, but it was also really interesting to watch scientists work with large data sets. And we'll get to that with deep learning in a second. 2014, I got the entrepreneurial bug again. 
there's, a, there's a group at Tandem Launch uh, called Tandem Launch. This is a Montreal incubator. If you don't know about it, you should. They're very committed to deep tech, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in uh, going into deep tech to, to check them out. Uh, they basically are models that'll bring tech from universities, they'll bring people together, start companies. So they approached me to work on uh, on a video processing system. And I was really I was really excited because I think I was ready to get out of you know, computer graphics and say, hey, let's let's look at the other side of this. And so we worked on video denoising. Um, yeah, and uh, oh, one way, yeah, so we built the world's best video denoiser uh, for two years. We sold it to Hollywood. Uh, of course I don't have the video, so that's Mark Cuban, we'll talk about it in a second. But that was the launch, when they launched it in Hollywood. This is, you can't see on the screen, but this is the noisy side, and this is the clean side, and Mark was generous enough to, um, to be in the film. So they actually filmed this commercial uh, off-site, off, just outside of Shark Tank. So we got basically an hour, so I'll explain what's going on. So, um, so we're building a denoiser, selling the denoiser, but we also got to raise some money. So uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, get a hold of Mark. Mark saw what we wanted to work on long term, got excited, and uh, not only did he invest, he became a board member. Obviously he does a lot of deals, but uh, he's probably on about 10 boards, so he's a board member. So he's been so generous with our time, his time. So he uh, we wanted to make a video showing the denoising, but again, we've got Mark Cuban. So, the idea, so we went down, and we, and we said, Mark, we want to make this, this video of you. And we went down, and we had one hour with him in between Shark Tank episodes or whatever, and, and literally shot the whole thing right there. And so, so, after the denoiser, what's next? So this is what we started to learn. And then again, this is why I want you to really so, you know, think about bringing elements from different worlds, right? So this is the world we know, right? I call it this. Computer games are this. You take data sets, you'll call them levels. I, I think of them as just as data sets. And what do you do? You apply compute and you generate visual complexity. That's for me all what a computer game is. You know, um, levels, compute, visual. But look at this. We take the dual, uh, you take the visual complexity of the world right here. We apply compute and reduce it to. What's that? Well, it happens to be called computer vision. I thought, wow, that's really cool. That's just intellectually nice. <laughs> but we also knew that this was going to be a big, big field. So we got our big break in 2016, where because we had a good reputation of the other companies and stuff, uh, Disney approached us to work on the Disney AR challenge. I don't know. Has anyone tried that out yet? It's, I mean, it's, 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 it, you really have to try it to understand it. It's, it's very audacious, right? What they're trying to do is for a couple hundred bucks, give you a complete uh, augmented reality experience. So the idea is you, you, buy, you, buy, you buy your lightsaber, you've got a specialty helmet, but you put your phone in. And so we, we did the uh, computer vision software stack for that. And what? Great people to work with, love working with them, super challenge. But what did we learn out of that? We learned a couple things. We learned, wow, everyone's packing a supercomputer. Like, seriously, all the compute is done on a phone. And remember, go back, go back to 1981, where for a thousand bucks, I've got a 16K, I don't know what they were that thing once, but I love it, you know. Now everyone literally carries a supercomputer and how they you know, with, with cameras. And I said, like, well, this is just going to open up so many possibilities. So we really dug it out. We thought that was really interesting. And um, but we, the other thing we learned was we wrote all that software using traditional computer vision techniques. And so when it works with computer, traditional computer vision, it works really well. But the minute you step outside of your use case, it's extremely brittle. And we said, this has, there has to be a different, a better way. And this is where we started thinking about deep learning. And, and just to give you a sense of how fast the space is evolving, in 2016, nobody was talking about deep learning. It was super rare. Or at the beginning of 2016. By the 20, end of 2016, crazy people like us were talking about it. By now, in, in 2018, 
2018, everyone's talking, if you're not using deep learning, you're in trouble. Uh, and again, that's just as an aside, outside of scope, but if you're a programmer and you're in the game space, you need to learn about deep learning. If you, if you can boil your problem down to a bunch of labeled data sets, you owe it to yourself to be, be I would be a deep learning, deep learning first person. I mean, you don't need a PhD to do deep learning. Our team has half PhDs, half go, but everyone does deep learning. You know, we'll take people out of university and we'll make them into machine learning experts in a year. So, so the next news I had are, 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 are my teenage daughters. I love very dearly. And so, right, 2016, they're playing with this thing called Snapchat. And I'm like, what is this? You know, and they're like, I, 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 I assembled this deck on the plane from San Diego last night, so I don't have any photos of them, unfortunately. And it's a snap, so it's ephemeral. Anyways, right? But it was really fascinating to watch how they're so engaged in this device, just, you know, putting you know, rabbit ears on their face and stuff. I'm like, wow, this is interesting. But I think the magical thing that I liked about Snapchat was, other than it was a complete waste of all the science, was that, was that it was the interactivity, the fact that you could see yourself. Man, it's so compelling. And I, I think it was probably Snapchat filters still to this day are probably one of the most compelling AR experiences we have. Because it's you, but it's not you. And then again, that just think back. For me, if you go all the way back to visual effects, right? Visual effects have always been about taking the real world and adding some kind of synthetic element, if you will, in a, in a way that you can't tell. It's just now. So it's, in a certain sense, we've been doing augmented reality forever. Now it's just interactive. But for me, visual effects is augmented reality. So then um, the other thing I noticed, sorry my slides don't turn with this, is, you know, we're gamers at home, and so uh, they're going to hate me for this. So that's my wife and two daughters and two friends playing Connect. And I really just, uh, I was filming them for denoising testing. That's why actually they're on lighting conditions. That's why I was doing it. But I just love the joy of watching them play together and have a social experience, you know? Now, um, if you've used the Connect, you know that it's got good and it's bad, right? It's, the good is when it works, it's really fun and, 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 and it's super immersive. The problems are you need a big space, you need this big ugly piece of plastic, you need, you need an Xbox, you need all this stuff. So it's a huge friction. But we had this idea. What if we could do this? What if we could put all the power of a Kinect onto an iPhone? Wow. That would be that would be crazy, right? Remember, Connect. They spent five hundred million dollars developing like Microsoft Connect. Um, but we said, what if we could do that? You know, we could all the fun of Snapchat and then all the power of Connect put it together in a thing. So that's that's um, that was really the inspiration. I'd love to say that Bill inspired me, but I, I dug this up after. But I think this is a great quote uh, that I'll read uh, from from Bill Gates. You know. What if we could build computers that one day could see, hear, talk, and understand human beings? And that's 1991. I think the other message I want to pass to you is the future is here. It's really an amazing time. Again, I've been a technologist for 40 years, and the last couple of years are just mind-numbingly fast. And, and all the stuff that we dreamed of even 10 years ago, it's just happy, happening. So, so think of all the things we can do, you know. Don't think about how we can do it, but what if we could, what if a camera couldn't read body language? So, then we're gonna step back and shift here. We've been talking about modern games, and, and uh, you know, I love computer graphics, I love games. But this is my third company. I had a lot of fun, uh, had a lot of success. But you get to a certain place in life where you want to, you know, you want to do a little more than just have fun. You want to build something that's big and hopefully, you know, helpful. Uh, having fun is good. And don't get me wrong. I love it. Um, but so, you know, this is this is a use case that's really important to me because my my maternal grandmother, she um, after my grandfather died, she uh, lived alone in town, and my mom would come and visit. 
you know, about every day. You know, we'll have lunch with her, make sure she's okay, and she's like living on her own. And so the one day my grandmother, my mother could not visit my, um, my grandma. She has a stroke. And my mom didn't come to see her for three days because just, you know, life, right? Like, you know, my mom. And my grandmother laid on the floor for three days. And if you know anything about thinking about stroke, she'd never the same again. And she was a super vibrant woman. You know, she taught me how to read. She, you know, we used to write like crazy long letters to each other when I was traveling and stuff. And that, all that was gone. Just, I mean, she was still there, but she was not there. And it was the most heartbreaking thing ever. And, you know, we just, we just could sit together and she just squeezed my hand, but that was it. And if you know anything about strokes, it, it really is a time curve, right? The faster you can get uh, medical help, the more you can diminish those effects. And, you know, I know there's not a day that goes by that I, my mom doesn't think about this. Right? She's really too hard on herself, it's just bad luck. But, so, we're envisioning a world where, you know, there are going to be cameras in the world, in the house, there already are. There's going to be robots interacting. Maybe it's an Alexa device. There'll be a variety. But I think it's super important that these devices, if someone, if someone you know, has a stroke or someone trips, you know, that we can understand that. We can understand and, and communicate to that person and say, hey, are you okay? You know, move your hand if you're, if you're okay. And if nothing happened, you know, you'd be like, I, I trip, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm good, you know, whatever. And then that doesn't do anything. But if you, otherwise it calls 911 and someone can help. I think that's a super, super important problem we need to solve. It, it, it's fantastic we can use game technology to solve it, but it's really an important problem. And it's not going to go away. It's going to get bigger and bigger. Demographics are clear, you know. Populations are aging, and the desire for autonomy is there. I want to live, you know, I want to live in my house as long as possible. I think that is very normal. So another big thing that's happening, and, and we're living right now, is Tom Scales. So, you know, and it's in the news right now, and, and, and it's a very big problem. I think there's been a lot of great work on autonomous vehicles, how you keep the vehicles on the road. What's the state of the art for uh, understanding people? The state of the art, if you ever see like video footage of what a autonomous vehicle looks like, it, it, you're just a bounty box. You're literally a box that says human, you know, kid. That's it. Now, if you drive, um, imagine you drove with that knowledge that just said human, human, human. You can't drive. You can't not drive properly with that level of knowledge, right? You have to understand. You know, is that person, you have to read the intent, is that person going to go across the street? Is that kid running after a ball? What's happening? You know, what's happening? You know, have you scared the have you, have, you, have you scared the pedestrian? Just think, we're gonna live in this really interesting time to determine how long where there will be the world we have, and then slowly autonomous vehicles come in. But it's not like we turn a, we're gonna flip a switch and autonomous vehicle all of a sudden saw autonomous vehicles. It would be this crazy hybrid world for a long time. And how do we, like, you know, there's a traffic cop who's doing traffic like this, stop. Now all of a sudden you've got 10% mix of autonomous vehicles. What is the autonomous vehicle supposed to do? People are not going to be carrying multiple apps to communicate to these cars. We, we need to have cars. It's crazy, but when we started thinking about this, it's like, wow, how, how will those cars control themselves? Um, on a healthier note, uh, you know, it's, and, and I think Connect pushed this a little bit, is, you know, we all want to be healthier. Uh, one of the great things about a personal trainer is that person's an expert and can watch you and can make sure that you do, it's not just about motivation, but can really help you have the right form, protect yourself, you know? They should know cheap, you know? Like, no, give me like 10 real burpees, not like the, you know, the, you know, the, the wannabe burpees. Give me the real burpees. And, now, people can't afford it, and not everyone's lucky enough to have a trainer. And also, if you travel, like, it's like crazy, you can't, your trainer, you can't put your trainer in a box. Uh, so, I think, we, I think you're going to see very soon in mobile phones, there are a lot of apps that are going to act as your personal trainer. Uh, healthier, I mean, just building on that. Again, we really are living in the future. Your phone is becoming a tricorder. 
right? You will start to be able to analyze people's gates. There's a lot of interesting things we can tell, you know, watching people's gates on, on, on certain diseases. Now, easier. Who doesn't like easy? Uh, we all want convenience. We're a, we're a society that's uh, obsessed with convenience uh, and, and, and saving time because we live crazy busy lives. So this is another big trend, this frictionless shopping. Um, you will walk into a store, a corner store, or a debitor, or a convenience store, and just grab it up, right? Just literally walk in, hi, Dr. Paul, I grab my stuff, and I go. This is happening, but the only way this is going to happen is if computers can understand what you're doing in the store. It actually has to understand what you're taking. And anybody, I'll just sort of share some use cases just to sort of get the juices flowing. The obvious is like, oh, I take this, I put it in my cart. Then, that, that's good. Now, I take this, oh, how many times have you done this where it's like, oh, I don't want this anymore. You put it, okay, I never do that, but I've seen it now. You put it there and you just keep walking. How do you handle it? Or even more, it's like you're going with body. And you're like, yeah, hey, yo, and you throw it at your friend and you catch it. Like, all that kind of stuff we take for granted. This has to be something. This is, this is the robots, again, on this thing of we really are living in Tomorrowland. Robots are coming. Um, they're going to come in so many ways. It's so fascinating. And again, just like autonomous vehicles, for me, they're like super robots. But we, we want all of this technology to adopt to us. We want this to be a human-centric world we're building, not a machine-centric world. So the robots need to understand us I mean, on a basic level. So if, like, if I'm going to pass something to a robot, it needs to know where my hand is, right? And again, we want to be in a come-as-you-go world, right? We don't want to have to put on funny suits. We don't want to say, well, because it's just like everyone's... I want to just go to the robot and give the robot something. I want the robot to give me something. Oh, if I buy a cleaning robot, I want to say, you know, boy, with my laser pointer, I can be like, clean up over there. That's how we need to think, right? You shouldn't settle for less. Just say, you go do that there. And it just goes and does it. Um, so collaborative robots, very interesting. So I'm, I'm, I'm getting low on time. I spoke a little too much. What I want to say is one technology can solve all this. That's what's really interesting. Because humans are humans. It doesn't matter what the use case is. We're all humans. And all these use cases can be done by humans. These, all these use cases can be done by humans. We believe in deep learning. We can solve this problem. So um, it's called human pose estimation for those of you so here, I'll, I'll, I'm going to give a demo right now. In the back, and this will just give credit to some of our awesome team. So that's Edward. He's doing the right shuffle. That's Maggie. She runs engineering. And that's all running on the phone right today. So let me see. You know what? Let's, let's go right to the demo. All right. Oh, look. So you can see right here. So I've got this running on a laptop. So here I am, and I'm tracking 85 points on my body, tracking my hands, there's 21 joints in the hand, 20, you know, 20 odd joints in the shoulders, and then in the face, facial tracking, you notice super high fidelity in the slides. Most things will just die. When you turn like this, it will just die on you. But what's fun is we know where, where people are. We get rid of the people. Oh look, it's, it's virtual green screen, just like that. It cannot see, it's been configured so it cannot see people in the back because of the computing, but we'll just sort of pan. But yeah, so this is now this is just a, a junky webcam, right? This is nothing special here. And I think that's important. What we want to make sure is that we're not doing anything fancy. We want this to work with any camera. Because this should just be part of this is like rendering. That's how I look at it. So it should just work. So, but oh wait, there's more. Um, why don't I, I'm going to go to the back now. I'll let that run. We're going to give you a live. We had some we had some cable issues, but we've got it running live on a mobile phone back here, which will go to your screen. My assistant Greg has it all queued up. Thank you. All right. So yeah, sorry, we just couldn't make. So I just need. This young man here. So it works on one. It works right now. Works on one person only. Come, come, don't worry. It's a passive sensor. We're not actually sending anything 
out so you will not die. Okay. There you go. So yes, yeah, so this is running local. There's no cloud nonsense. Um, so we got hands running here. I don't know why the camera's so grainy today, but anyways, get virtual green screen. There you go. So this is running live on the phone. No one's ever done it at this frame rate. We're running at 12 frames per second on Samsung S8. That's um, three times faster than uh, Facebook. Uh, all right, now, wait, there's more. Because that's like just your fun tech demo. Now, because this is a game show. So, it's loading up about six different uh, CNNs. Convolution. Drive a three dimensional rig, I promise. Okay, oh, there we go. So here you are. And it's a little space that they can light you on fire. <laughs> Full, oh, yeah, to try it out there. Full body fire. And you can accelerate, you can get your angel wings on. Or if you're more into Iron Man kind of thing, you know, like you could be Iron Man in Paris. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Appreciate your hand for our video audience. Sorry, we just couldn't get those cables working. All right. Um, I know we've got about 15 minutes left, so I'm going to just turn this off. And nope, I'm not going to turn it off. And um, let me see. It will just talk to, oh, you know what, oh, here. This, I'll explain this and then we can get anything. So how do you do this? What's the science behind this? At a high level. So that, that's, um, that's Maggie, uh, Maggie and Maggie Kate. And so how do we teach computers to understand what's going on in this picture, right? Like it all looks really cool, but I can't do this. So, so it, it works like this. <coughs> the fundamental technology called key point training. So what we do, is we've exposed the computer to hundreds of thousands of images. And each image is labeled meticulously with people doing this. Uh, they label the eyes, the nose, the ears, the shoulders, all these points. And so we literally have people doing this, and they do great, great work. Uh, and so we just, and it's a lot like letters, you know? And, and what, if, you, if you have small children, or if you have small children, this is how they learn to read. I did this lots. Every night, you know, reading the same story again and again and again. But that's what deep learning is, you know. I'm keeping it simple, but at the end of the day, you're exposing a computer to huge data sets, and it's forming a network of weights. Then the next thing to do is once we have all the key points, so we know all your body parts. It sounds a little morbid, right? But we have all your body parts, but then we glue you together as individuals, uh, which turns out to be a hard problem. You guys are all neat arranged here, but like once you know one person puts the hands over another and stuff, you see it gets, it gets very interesting. So then once we have the body parts, once we have the skeletons, we know the individuals, then we can start to have fun. We can start to infer what the gestures are, right? So you can see here, because the skeleton, now we know where James is. James is touching his chin. Then he's holding something. That's all we know at this point, right? And with, but the next level is, once, once we know what people are, are doing, their bodies and stuff, we can start to infer, then we can say we're, 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 where Maggie's holding a phone, we throw a bounding box, we, we call another computer vision API, we say, okay, what is that? Oh, it's a phone. Oh, well, if, it, <coughs> if it's a phone, and Maggie's holding it, and she's pointing at James, she must be filming it. So I showed the demos. Um, you know what? Let me just traction. Uh, so, um, you know what? Why don't we just go right to the QA? Because I know I know we're low on time. I can just always go back. That's the that's the chicken. Uh, with, uh, so that's Andre. So this will be running at the Canadian booth uh, afterwards. So again, this is where. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. This demo is such a blast. It's all running on this laptop. We used Unreal, uh, you know, built right here uh, in North Carolina, uh, the Unreal Engine. We used uh, Quebec artist. That's Andre. That's our dog, Molly. And so 
that, that same webcam is driving this character, and you become a chicken, and you make eggs, and yeah, it's fun. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Uh, all open for questions. machine vision cameras, so then you get two 2D feeds or you get a way better 3D. 
So there's a lot of, and then getting back to the other uh, point I made to the other gentleman, uh, we need to start doing, uh, you know, right now we're only doing spatial inferencing and we need to do temporal inferencing. So there's the question for you. Hi, this is a quick two part question. For the image recognition, are you guys taking and categorizing all those photos yourself? And how many have you taken and categorized? So, uh, great question. Um, I actually, I have a little slide on that. Um, hopefully, it's not too far away. Yeah, so the training pipeline. So, it's a mix. So, there are databases out there. Uh, one of the problems with the databases is, is that nobody has toes. And we think toes, it, it sounds crazy, but no one has toes. So you'll know, all of a sudden, we start drilling, we're like, and no one has toes. The only the rich people have toes. So we, we took all, a lot of existing databases, added toes. We've taken a lot of, we're working on these unannounced projects where, again, it works, and then they, they give us video, and it's like, oh man, this works. So then we take all that video, we annotate it, and we put it in the model so we make it more robust. But, and this was another game twist I wanted to talk about, uh, we use synthetic data. So, again, you can build virtual humans. The, the promise is if you can build virtual humans that are photorealistic, you render them out, there's, there's your image. But you've got perfect annotation data because you know exactly where the bones are and everything. Uh, super interesting. I'm, uh, I mean, I've been doing human simulations in 98. I'm long on it, but here's where we're at today. And I was surprised how hard it was. So people are making really great gains on um, using it for driving simulators, where you take like the classic GTA, you know, and and, and, rip and, and and hack it and do that. That works, but I think on humans, we're just not there yet. In a sense, and I'll, I'll compare this to synthetic fuels, if you will, where you're still sort of going like an 80-20 blend of like 80% real gas and then 20% ethanol. That's where we're at, and we're not really sure why. Our hypothesis is, the, is that is that it's just the visual variety of humans. Like if you just line up everyone here, and even though it's a game conference of groups, it's you're going to get so much variety. You know, of, you know, body morphologies, dress, skin colors, everything, and that turns out to be just really hard. You think you can just and generate all these virtual it turns out to be really, really hard. So I, I think there's going to be a long time still. But we'll get there. And I, I have this like matrix fantasy where I can dial up any group of people and I dial up any environment and just go choo choo choo. But give me five years. <laughs> yep. So how do you figure out where all the joints are and connect them? Uh, so how do we... So the, annotate, the data is also been annotated with the joint connections. And uh, that's part of our secret sauce. Sorry, it's not really... It's, it's not a very satisfying answer, but it's yeah, secret sauce. There's not much I can say. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's hard. We, 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 smart people working hard. Um, yeah. One, two, three. So sort of a follow-up to the previous two questions, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so I understand how you're going, you're doing the visual recognition. How are you going from that with the proprietary model to um, the classification part of, portion of the problem? So like you're, you're tracking, but now you're trying to say, OK, yeah. he's touching his chin, or she's holding something. We have, we have a, 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 another model. It's a, a, we have another model, an action, action activity recognition model that we're developing that, that uses LTSM. That's about all I can say. How are you generating that data? We have more data sets. So we, we literally have, if it's the thinking thing, we I can't get into the specifics of what we're doing, but the, the thinking thing, we've got a whole bunch of data sets and they're getting labeled. Yeah. But the, 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 the unique thing that we're doing is we boil everyone into a skeleton first, and so we, we believe that's a more robust way of solving it. Yeah, it's data, it's just you can't escape it. You know, just terabytes of data. So, excellent, uh, Gina. Um, I'm really interested, though, uh, so far you're using only able-bodied people? Yep. 
what about less able-bodied amputees, that kind of thing, and, and one other follow-up. On your excellent team image, you have a dog. Yep. And I was thinking about things like uh, machine learning with walking and dogs and stuff. Yep. Are you planning on, um, you know, because uh, cars don't know what the intention is with okay. someone with a dog? So, uh, that's two parts. Yep. So the first part was on on, on on disabilities and variety. This goes on the theory of the thing of variety. Yeah, so we're working on this theme park, uh, unannounced theme park. Uh, uh, experience, and I have to say, the company we're working with is so committed to that that they brought, they brought us up, and so we know we've tested it. Like we know when we go into the field, and you know, especially the world we live now, people are not going to have hands, they're not going to have arms, and we've tested it locally by just you know things like that, or, or, or it's what's important. And the the the, the, the bottom up joint clustering helps a lot to that. It's a lot more robust if you like this. Um, it works pretty robustly on uh, people who are missing fingers. If, if you permit me, the craziest use case, I was at a computer vision conference, this guy had a really, very, very nice, he goes, he looks at me, he's like, this will work on me, like this. He's got an extra finger. And I'm like, he just looks at me, I'm like, whoa, man. And um, so it counted to five, but there's no way it could, know that. So that, that that was a real outlier. Like anyway, he was a very, very, very nice man. So yeah, that's that's totally important. Moving on to uh, non-humans. So something super interesting intellectually, tech wise, pretty straightforward. I think it's a question of business case. That that's my biggest thing. Um, in the sense that A, we're just overloaded already with work. But and 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 I actually as a uh, as a dog nut myself, um, everybody my family knows this office of this, is that I really worry that, you know, that somehow animals are going to get lost in the shuffle of all of this, and I, I would be personally really sad if it's just humans and robots, and that, that's it. So, yeah, I, I would say, it's, I, I, I'm hoping five years from now, that's part of our software, because that would be, that, that would just, I think it's the right thing to do, but we don't, uh, as a business, we can't get to and last but not least, we have our last question before breaking out for lunch. Hey, I was just wondering how robust your technique is to things like occlusion. Like if a, if a camera is tracking someone and they walk behind a building and come out the other side, does it is there is that a function of just getting more data, or is it uh, is there more inference logic that you put in there? So that actual tracking problem we're not working on yet. That's an excellent question. Hard. Uh, we are only tracking skeletons that are visible. So we can keep track of like this and that, but if you go out of frame, we, we, we forget. But um, it's on our roadmap to solve. Thank you.